let me, which we denote by A of gamma or A of m. And this is, let me write it briefly this way, it's the, the algebra generated over Q by the group gamma squared. So it's linear combinations of Q multiples of elements of gamma squared. So I can write it quickly this way. And uh, let me start by telling you a nice way of computing the extent, the, how one can compute the invariant trace field, or how Snap and Snappy actually compute the invariant trace field. So, so you, you've been told how Snap and Snappy base their calculations on writing, on triangulating your M, so writing your M as a union of simplices. I'm going to call these simplices delta Z1 through delta Zn. So delta Zi here is an ideal simplex. With simplex parameter in the sense that Craig Hodgson described ZI. So let me remind you what this means. There's a couple of ways of describing it. You have your ideal simplex, so it's a simplex with its vertices at infinity. Let's say a total of four vertices, and let me get the labeling right. I'll call these, let's say, x0, x1, x2, x3 of the three vertices. So these vertices xi, they're in this sphere at infinity of hyperbolic space. And the sphere at, in, at infinity of hyperbolic space, you can think of as C union infinity, or you can think of it as the complex, complex projective line. But let's think of it as C union infinity. It's a nice two-sphere. And the parameter z associated to this, so we have a parameter which is actually associated to the simplex plus a choice of an edge. This is defined as the cross ratio of these four numbers. This is a standard concept out of projective geometry. It's the only invariant of four points in a projective line. It's defined as x2 minus, uh, let me get the version that I'm using, make sure that I'm using the right one, x2 minus x1 times x3 minus x0 over x2 minus x0 times x3 minus x1. Okay. So this is a slightly different way from how Craig Hodgson described it, but you can check, as he described it, you can always move in the upper half space model to put the vertices at 0, infinity, 1, and some point z. So you move your simplex to be in this position, and then if you number the vertices appropriately, and I've forgotten which order we have to number them, z is then the parameter. I'm just on the basis of this, this is the edge to which z is attached. So I guess that means that we've got, ah, what, I missed an edge there. Um, that means that this is x0, x1, x2, and x3 in this order. So that's another way of describing it. Now then the cross ratio, if we change the order of these vertices but preserving orientation, that means using an alternating permutation of 0 through 3, we get different cross ratios. And there are 24 permutations, but only 12 of them preserving orientation. So we get a priori 12 different um, 
cross ratios. How am I getting? Yeah, 12 different cross ratios. But in fact, they turn out to pair up. And there are only three different ones. Somehow 12 divided by 2 is not 3. <laughs> Where did I calculate wrong? Anyway, we have, there are only three different cross ratios that arise as you permute preserving orientation. And these are opposite sides have the same parameter. And then you have a z prime and a z double prime on opposite sides, where z prime is equal to 1 over 1 minus z, and z double prime is equal to 1 minus 1 over z. Okay. So these parameters are, there's a, there's a little bit of flexibility in the choice of a parameter, but we simply choose one, some, or, some ordering of the vertices and then have these parameters. So we write our M, we triangulate our manifold M using ideal simplices. And now then, we can define a field, I'll call it the triangulation field, K sub delta, is simply going to be the field generated by these parameters. And a nice computational theorem is that k delta is actually equal to the invariant trace field of m, so in fact doesn't depend on the triangulation, if m is non-compact, if m has cusps. In general, k delta contains k of m. Now, you might ask, what do I mean by the case? So this is if m is closed. You might ask, what do I mean by an ideal triangulation of something which is closed? And how do we ideally triangulate something that is closed? And the simplest way of doing that was described by Craig, if you've got a non-compact manifold, so if you've got a manifold with cusps, then you always have ideal triangulations. And Craig described how you could deform the geometry on something with cusps um, to perform Dane filling to fill in the cusps by solid tori. And every compact manifold, by drilling out a geodesic, you can turn it into something where you could get your original compact manifold back again by doing Dane surgery. So what you do, one of the ways of getting a triangulation using ideal simplices is that you drill out a geodesic to get something non-compact, triangulate that, and then do the deformation that turns it into a compact manifold that does the Dane filling again. And so the triangulations that you obtain this way, triangulations of compact manifolds, obtained by Dane filling, they actually, they triangulate M minus some closed curves so minus some geodesics and near a geodesic so if you have a geodesic inside of your manifold what you actually see you have your ideal simplex which has a vertex of it is getting very thin and getting very narrow with a triangular cross-section, and what it's doing is it's spiraling in closer and closer to the removed geodesic, but never actually touching it. And the triangulation is filling out the region around the geodesic by these ends of ideal simplices actually spiraling in towards the geodesic. And Craig showed a picture in the two-dimensional case of what the analogous thing is in the two-dimensional case. 
So that's the way one triangulates compact manifolds. Um, one can actually look at very much more general kind of quote triangulations, so quasi-triangulations. All one really needs is some nice complex put together out of ideal simplices that maps degree one by a degree one map to M and has is onto almost everywhere. So as a almost everywhere degree one. And triangulations like that will work perfectly well and these calculations work. Such a triangulation, when you're just asking it to be degree one, you might have some simplices that are mapping with negative orientation. And we'll come back to issues that that raises later on as we talk about other calculations. But anyway, from an ideal triangulation, and these ideal triangulations are fairly easy to come by, you get this way of computing the invariant trace field. Now then, once one has a triangulation, Craig also described how Snap and Snappy um, computes the hyperbolic structure and you could therefore uh, get the hyperbolic structure accurately. And to then get the, so to get the invariant trace field, and if you've got something non-compact, you can go directly from just the parameters of the triangulation. If you've got something compact, you do it actually by computing traces after you've worked out the hyperbolic structure. So that's not too hard. Then getting the invariant quaternion algebra, there's a nice formula for the quaternion algebra. Remember the way that uh, quaternion algebra is described is you can describe it by a Hilbert symbol, alpha, beta, k, where this means you take the quaternion algebra generated by i and j with i squared equal to alpha, j squared equal to beta, i j equal to minus j i. And if you know the Hilbert symbol, it's not too hard from the Hilbert symbol to work out where the ramification is, and therefore to get the list of primes that is the more convenient classifying object for the, um, for the quaternion algebra. So how do we compute these in the case of a manifold? Well, it turns out if we pick two elements in our group gamma with the property that they're not equal to each other, then we can always take alpha equal to the trace of the commutator of g of h squared. Let me get this right. Uh, trace of commutator squared. Sorry, just trace of commutator minus 2. And beta equal to the trace of one of the two elements squared minus 2. So we can simply write down a Hilbert symbol and from that, one can then compute the quaternion algebra. For any GH. Pardon? For any GH. Uh, for any GH with GH not equal to HG. And one also needs to make sure um, one should avoid trace equal to 2. So one avoids parabolic elements. So trace of G and trace of H not equal to 2. I think it's sufficient to assume one of them is non-parabolic. So let me actually describe a, an explicit example. Hi. Oh, one other thing I'd like to say, which I think no one has said yet, um, we've talked about arithmetic manifolds. And we've talked about how they come about. So let me remind you that M arithmetic you start off with a field K with one complex place. A 
quaternion algebra, which is ramified at every real place. So the field can have arbitrarily high degree, but most of the degree has to come from the real places. And then out of this, you, you then take an order in this field. You take the norm one elements in that order, that, and that is the arithmetic group. Now then, it's a theorem of Reed. But, and notice that when you take the order, you're taking something. The order is a subset of the um, algebraic integers of A. And therefore, one of the other things about the object that you create is that the traces of all of the elements in the group you create are algebraic integers. So, and it's a theorem of Reed that those are necessary and sufficient conditions for arithmeticity. So first of all, the invariant trace field should have one complex place. Secondly, the quaternion algebra should be ramified at every real place. And thirdly, trace of gamma should be an algebraic integer. For all gamma and gamma. So again, once one's got a program like SNAP, which computes all of these things, it becomes a very easy thing to detect arithmeticity and decide if a manifold is arithmetic. So the example I'd like to de describe is you start off with the third manifold in the cusp census. That's usually called M3. So this is the census of manifolds you get um, by putting together as few simplices as possible. And then I'm going to do minus 3-1 Dane surgery on this. So this is SNAP and SNAPI allow you to ask for this manifold and then do the Dane surgery on it. And in this particular case, the calculation gives us that the field in question, K of M, is, well, it's the field... It's a cubic field, and the minimal polynomial, or a minimal polynomial for a generator of this cubic field is this. Now, we need to give it, remember, the field is a concrete field. It's a field that we embed in C, and the way we embed it in C is by specifying which of the zeros of this polynomial we take. So it's embedded using the zero you can check that x equal to 0 0.877 approximately minus 0 0.745 times i, that this is a zero of this polynomial, and this is the embedding one uses. So this is a concrete number field. One then checks that the quaternion algebra has Hilbert symbol given by, so we have to give ourselves two elements of this field, and I'll write them down in terms of x. So this is the quaternion algebra that SNAP, in fact, computes. And then from this, it's easy to work out the ramification. The ramification. Notice this is a cubic field. It has a complex root. It has to have a complex root because our fields always have a complex embedding. So two complex roots. The complex conjugate is also a root. So there's also a real root. There is a real embedding. And the ramification is the real embedding and 
the, the, the ramification set has to be an even size set, so there has to be at least one other thing, and there's exactly one other thing. It's a one of the two prime divisors of the int rational prime five. And I rem if I remember rightly, it's the ideal generated by five and x minus two. That's correct. So it's this rational prime divisor. Okay. So we've got the first two properties here. It's got one complex place. It's ramified at every real place because there is only one real place. Finally, it's very easy to check that the traces are, in this case, algebraic integers. So this is arithmetic. I'm just confused. We dealt with the square of the traces, but you load down the word, which is just the trace of the gamma. I mean, the quaternion algebra and everything was Invariant trace field. That's right. This this is I'm talking here about the invariant trace field. Oh, I, I'm sorry. When I talk about integral traces, yeah, it's sufficient. This is actually a commensurability property. If if a group has integral traces, then any finite index subgroup has integral traces, and vice versa. So you're right. I I could have written gamma squared here. And that would have made it clearer that it's connecting with the, um, with the invariant trace field. But in fact, it's a little bit, you'll have fewer generators when you look at the group gamma in general. So it's easier to compute this actually in the group gamma you were first given. But having integral traces is a commensurability invariant as well. So this is arithmetic. It's a compact manifold. It's arithmetic. And notice it's ramified at this prime, which is definitely not equal to its complex conjugate. So the quaternion algebra is not equal to its complex conjugate. And therefore, this is a manifold which has no cover with an orientation reversing map. So we can read off the geometric properties. So ju that's just to give an example of what one could actually compute. So now I'd like to move on to the topic was that I intended for today's talk, which is to continue to other invariants. And algebraic to topological invariants of, of a manifold. And I'd like to start with one that is simply based on cohomology. So, invariant from algebraic topology. Because it leads to a very important analytic invariant that pairs itself with volume and has similar importance actually to volume. But to see to define this invariant, I need to go through an algebraic topological invariant. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to assume for the moment that my manifold H3 mod gamma is compact. Okay. Now then, we have the homomorphism of gamma to PSL 2C which defines gamma as given as a subgroup of PSL2C. Okay. Now I'm going to do a rather radical thing to PSL2C. I'm going to forget its topology and just think of it as a discrete group. Okay. That's a rather terrible thing to do to a Lie group, but we're going to do that. Okay. And because I'll be talking about this quite a lot, I'm just going to abbreviate this as G for the rest of this talk. So G, G is always PSL 2C, but regarded as a discrete group, just for the purpose of this talk. 
Now, whenever you have the map of, this is the fundamental group of a manifold, whenever you have a map of the fundamental group of a space to a discrete group, there's a classifying map unique up to homotopy from from the actual space that you're looking at to the classifying space for this discrete group which when often writes classifying spaces for groups as BG but in the case of a discrete group this is the same thing as an island bed McLean space KG1 this is simply a space whose fundamental group is G and whose all other homotopy groups are trivial so we get a map of M to BG and this gives us a map of H3 of M with integer coefficients to H3 of BG with integer coefficients and when you take the hom homology of the classifying space of a group that's the same thing as the homology of the group in the sense of group homology so we can also write this as H3 of GZ so this is the homology you compute if you've done any homological algebra you'll know the way you get this is you take a projective resolution of Z as a ZG module and then you tensor that resolution with Z and take the homology of the resulting thing so it's actually the Tor functor applied to Z as a ZG module is another way of thinking of it are using uh, topology, continuous topology. No, I'm, I'm using the discrete topology. BG. BG, I'm really taking BG as a discrete group. So when you have a discrete group, BG is the same thing as KG1. Okay, since G is discrete. If you've got a non-discrete group, BG is of course very different from KG1. So this is really, a, at first sight, a very horrible thing to do. You're taking this enormous Lie group. It's an uncountable group. And as a discrete group, it's very hard to imagine what this group looks like. But I'll tell you in a moment. Okay. But anyway, we take this map. Now then we have the fundamental class of M is the generator of H3 of MZ. Okay, this is this group is just Z generated by the fundamental class. So it maps to a class in this group, which I'll call the PSL fundamental class. Okay, I'm looking at this is the homology of PSL2C turned into a discrete group, and I'll look at this fundamental class in here. So that's the first invariant that I want to talk about. Now, of course, it's a useless invariant if we can't compute it. So what I'm going to describe to you is that this is actually a computable invariant. One can compare elements in this group, and one can compute it. So before I do that, let me explain why I want to study this element. So maybe just to make, make this feel a little bit more familiar, let me mention a theorem. This is DuPont and Sir, probably about 25 years ago. I forget ex the exact date, which describes what this group looks like. So you've taken this Lie group, you've made it discrete, and then you're taking its group homology. Looks like a horrible thing to do, but in fact, one can work out exactly what the torsion of this group is. The torsion of this group is Q mod Z. So this sits inside of H3 of GZ. And I'm saying that this is the torsion, so the quotient should be torsion free. Let me just call the quotient H0. Okay. So where H0 is not just torsion free, 
it turns out remarkably to be a Q vector space. They say Q vector space of infinite and conjecturally countable dimension. The Q, the Q is extremely mysterious. I mean, it comes out of extensive homology calculations. And it, it's very surprising. And the Q simply comes from the fact what one proves is that every element of this group is fully divisible, divisible by every integer, which means that any torsion part of it has to be sums of Q mod Zs and anything left over is a Q vector space. But it really is mysterious. It's very hard to explain why it's a Q vector space. It's a big surprise. But anyway, this once one knows that it's simply a Q vector space plus Q mod Z, of course, you can think of if you want as simply the union of all finite cyclic groups array finite cyclic groups in increasing size as it were and take their union and that's Q mod Z. The finite subgroups of Q mod Z are just the cyclic groups and so these are fairly nice groups to be thinking about. So this is just to make this feel a little bit more comfortable but the thing I want to talk about is this is a theorem of Chiga Chern Simons, which is there exists a map called C hat from H3 of GZ to C modulo pi squared Z. So, in other words, you look at complex numbers modulo multiples of pi squared with the property that if you apply this to the fundamental class of a three manifold you get something whose real part is the Chern Simons invariant of M and whose imaginary part is the volume of M. So here, Cs of m is the chern Simons invariant. So I don't want to go into detail about what the chern Simons invariant is. Rather, I'd like to take this as a definition of the chern Simons invariant. We'll come, I'll tell you how to compute it later. But let me just say in words what it is. You can think of volume as integrating over your manifold, simply the volume form over the manifold. And when you look at the formula for the volume form, it turns out that it kind of looks a bit like the real part of a, of a complex form, which has an imaginary part, which is not quite well-defined but you can still integrate it and get something that's well defined up to multiples of pi squared z. And this imaginary part is basically a curvature form coming from the manifold. So that's a very rough explanation of where the chern simons invariant comes from. It's a curvature form, inter integrating a curvature form over the manifold, an appropriate curvature form. And it's a curvature form which is closely related to the volume form. And this, the fact that they should be tied together was predicted by Thurston. Um, the fact that they are actually tied together in this way is, I think, well, I think, I'm not sure that Thurston was aware of this connection or which one predates the other. But anyway, so this is the definition of an important invariant that we'll be talking about. 
So CS we can think of as a mapping. This is the real part, so it's a mapping to R modular multiples of pi squared. Chern Simon. Now, another nice fact about this that we can prove by direct computation is that c hat is injected on the torsion subgroup q mod z sitting inside of h3 of gz. So if we can compute Chern Simon's invariant, then all that's left over is computing the other part. And to compute the other part, I'd like to go to a different invariant. So computing H3, well, computing the fundamental class MPSL in, so now then all we need is H3GZ modulo torsion. Because if we can compute Chen Simons, all we need is this remainder. And this group has a completely different name. This is the so-called block group, which is denoted B of C. And we get a very nice link with geometry here, which makes things easy to compute. So what I want to tell you is, what is the block group, and how do we compute it? So the block group comes very directly from geometry. So let me go back and define the block group while also describing how the PSL fundamental group, which lies in here, its image is then called the block invariant in the block group. And I'll call the image beta of m. So inside of here, we have beta of m, which is basically the image of, of the PSL fundamental group. So mod torsion. And I'll describe the block group while also describing what this beta of m is. So let me go back and remind you of how we are looking at our manifold when we use our program snap and snappy and so on. m is the union of ideal simplices okay. and the simplex parameters, their cross ratios and if you've got a non-degenerate simplex, the co cross ratio will be in C minus 0, 1. It's never equal to 0, 1 or infinity. It lies in the projective line. But the cross ratios 0, 1 and infinity come from degenerate cross ratios where two points have come together. So your cross ratios always lie in C minus 0, 1. So we'll do a very simple thing we'll take, I'll call it P of C, I'll simply take the free Z module on all possible simplex parameters. So if you want, this is the free Z module on the set of all possible simplex shapes. I'll simply say it's C minus 0, 1. But think of this as um, Think of this really as freezy mod module on simplex shapes. But now that we're going to factor by certain relations. And let me draw a picture of the relations first and then write it out algebraically. So a picture of the relation is if you take 
two simplices. Here's one, and here's another. Whoops, I want to draw. Which could be glued together along a face. So here I could glue these two simplices together along this common face. And if I do that, I can then cut them apart. And if I cut them apart, I can drop a perpendicular down in the center here and subdivide again into three simplices. So I get three simplices. Let me try to draw them. I've got one that looks something like this. In the back, I've got, in the front, I've got one that looks something like this. And on the right-hand side, I've got one that looks like this. Okay. So I'm just gluing two simplices together and cutting them apart in a new way. And I take all instances of this relation in this group and factor by them. Notice that these are things that you can do. If you have two simplices in M that are glued together along a face, you can change your triangulation by this sort of a move. This sort of move is called a Pachner move. And it's not changing M, but it's changing the triangulation. Now that if you give these simplices parameters, if their parameters are x and y, then you can write out algebraically what this relationship is saying. Algebraically, it's saying that the class of x minus the class of y plus the class of y over x, I believe, yeah, y over x, minus the class of 1 minus x inverse over 1 minus y inverse, plus the class of 1 minus x over 1 minus y. But every instance of this should be equal to 0 as x and y vary through c minus 0, 1 without any of these hitting either 0 or 1. Okay. So this, of course, is a horrendously big group still. It's still an uncountably generated group. But now then we take, and, and there's an obvious way that we can think of our manifold as an expressing an element in here. We simply take the sum of the classes of the zi's. And as I've said, this sort of retriangulation doesn't change anything, doesn't change the manifold, and we've made them into relations. So this is well-defined inside of PFC. But in fact, there's a nice map from PFC to another rather awkward group to get one's mind around. We look at C star. So C star is simply an abelian group. And therefore, any abelian group is a Z module. And any Z module, you can take the wedge product over Z with itself. And we take the map, which takes a generator here, to z wedge 1 minus c. And you can check, it's a simple cal calculation, that that is compatible with this relation. These relations map to 0 under this map. Okay. And it turns out that beta of m lies in the kernel of this. And the kernel of this map is, called, is what's called the block group, B of C, B, B of C. So we end up with this invariant of the manifold in the block group. So remember, the block group is just the quotient of third homology of PSL2C by its torsion subgroup. But this is giving a symbolic representation, as it were, of this particular group and telling us a nice, simple way from a triangulation to write down an element of this group. Yeah? So is, there, is there any general definition of the group? Uh, yes. If there's time, I'll come back to this. It's basically, I hope to talk a little bit about scissors congruence, and it's basically the Dane invariant complexified. So for anyone who knows what scissors congruence is, 
you'll know what I'm talking about. And if not, hopefully, I'll have time to say something about it later in the talk. OK. So now then, I promised you that doing things this way would would allow us to compute this. So I have to justify this. So the first point is to notice that our zi's all lie in the, in the simplex field in k delta. And every definition I've given here for, for b of c, you could replace c by any field. So similarly define um, B of K for any number field K. And what we see is that, well, first of all, it's a theorem that B of K Modulo torsion, again, injects into B of C using the inclusion of K into C. Okay. But moreover, we have that our invariant beta of M certainly lies in the block group for the field k delta generated by the simplex parameters. So this is just the invariant trace field if our manifold was an open, uh, was a cusped manifold, a non-compact manifold, but it's usually a larger field if the manifold is non-compact. Okay. And Finally, there's a theorem. Oh, let me just point out that we have maps beta of C, any element of beta of C, of B of C, of the block group, you think of as being a sum of simplices. And simplices have volume. And the relation that we did, this cutting and pasting relation, doesn't change volume. So we've got a volume map from B of C to R with the property that the volume of the block invariant of a manifold is simply the volume of the manifold. So a theorem of Borel is it's actually, uh, Burrell wasn't talking about the block group. He was talking about algebraic K-theory. And I will also very briefly mention the connection with algebraic K-theory later. But translated into these terms, blocks, Burrell's theorem says that you've got a map. If you've got a field K, you've got a map of B of K to R to the R2 where given an element in here, you have actually R2 different complex embeddings. And each of the complex embeddings is giving us a map of B of K to B of C, and therefore allows us to compute volume. So we take it to the vector where we take tau I of alpha, basically, and then the volume of that. I equals 1 of 2. R2, where the tau i are the complex embeddings of k. So you just take volume for each of the different complex embeddings. And Borel's theorem is that this is injective with image a full lattice. So in other words, a subgroup isomorphic to z to the R2 in R to the R2. Ah, and sorry, this is modulo torsion. Okay. 
So at the moment we're working modulo torsion and the Chern Simons invariant is then going to tell us recover the torsion for us. So again, once SNAP has an algebraic description of the manifold, once it knows the simplices and knows the ZIs and the field they live in, this is of course a trivial computation for SNAP, so long as SNAP knows how to compute the volume of an ideal simplex. So let me just tell you the volume of an ideal simplex, which is what we're summing here is a, very is a very beautiful number theoretic function, the so-called Wigner dialogarithm, and I hope I wrote down a formula for it. Um, but I didn't. Uh, it's a variation on the standard dialogarithm. Did I write it down? <coughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to waste time looking for it, so let me just say this is the so-called Wigner dialogarithm, which is you take the standard dialogarithm, Li2 of z, which is the sum of z to the n over n squared, okay? And this is an elementary variation of this, adding a couple of logarithm terms, ordinary logarithm terms of this. So, and you can find it in practically any paper that discusses volumes. You have the formula? Yeah. Great. <laughs> In my paper, that's where I was looking, but I couldn't find it that quickly. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So D2 of Z is the imaginary part of the standard dialogarithm plus the logarithm of the absolute value of Z times the angle, the argument of 1 minus Z. Okay. Pardon? Can I ask a question? Yeah. So you could take a k to the a invariant space field, concrete number field, it gives you volume, actual volume. That's right. So if you put it in different way, you see you get a different volume. You get different volumes, so exactly. That different volume geometrically? Uh, they are, geometrically, it's not clear what meaning they have. You can kind of think of, You've taken your manifold and you've somehow taken the Galois conjugate of the manifold, which is, yeah, it's unclear what that means. But these different volumes, one of the things you can prove, they actually, well, they correspond one way of thinking of it geometrically, is if you, you've got your map of gamma to PSL2C, when you do a Galois conjugation or take a different embedding, you're just giving a different homomorphism of gamma to PSL2C. So uh, there's special points in the representation variety of gamma into PSL2C, these Galois conjugates. That's one way of thinking of them. So this block invariant is giving you a vector of real numbers. You can always pick out the volume from this vector because it is always the largest one in absolute value. So volume is, among these numbers, volume is the largest. In fact, volume is the largest, the volume of a manifold is the largest volume you can get over any representation into PSL2C. You can define volume for arbitrary representation to c so long as you map parabolic elements, so cusp elements to parabolic elements. Uh, no, it won't be. This, the... The original representation is the only discrete faithful representation. So these are, they're still faithful, but they're absolutely not discrete. Okay. So at this point, okay, we could actually compute this. So we've computed the free part, as it were, 
of the PSL class. And all that remains, if I can compute the block invariant, all that remains is the Chern-Simons invariant. So the Chern-Simons invariant is also given, one could do it also by a similar symbolic calculation. But what you have to do is change the definition of the block group. And this is the so-called extended block group. So I think I just erased the picture I wanted. Let me remind you of this picture of an ideal simplex. C0, C1, C2, C3, and parameter X0, sorry, because the vertices. Then parameters Z, Z, Z prime, Z prime, Z double prime, Z double prime. OK, this is a simplex. And now then, if you look at one of these edges and its parameter z, the argument of z, in other words, the angle of z, z is its length times e to the i theta, where theta is the angle, that turns out to be the dihedral angle over here, is equal to the dihedral angle. And let me give that a name. Let me call that alpha. Okay. And I'll name the other dihedral angles beta and gamma. So we have an angle gamma here. So the argument of C prime is beta. The argument of Z double prime is gamma. And if you draw the picture in the version that Craig did of putting one vertex at infinity, then these dihedral angles are simply the dihedral angles of a cross-section triangle, a Euclidean triangle given by a horosphere as we take a cross-section of a vertex. And since this is a Euclidean triangle, you see that the angles add up to 180 degrees. Alpha plus beta plus gamma is equal to pi. Now, what we're going to do is a rather radical thing. We're going to change the angles to alpha prime, which is alpha plus a multiple of pi, beta prime, which is beta plus a multiple of pi, gamma prime equal to gamma plus a multiple of pi, with the property that the angles now add up to 0. And we call this a flattening of the simplex. If we've made all the, the sum of the angles equal to 0, it's reasonable to think of it as flat. So this is purely a combinatorial thing to do. Of course, we can't do this geometrically. It's just a combinatorial thing to do. So one way of thinking of this is that we've replaced the logarithm of z We've taken the logarithm of z, which has real part, the length, and the imaginary part, the angle. We've replaced it by the logarithm of z plus alpha pi i, ah, plus p pi i. Okay. And we've replaced the logarithm of 1 over 1 minus c by minus the logarithm of 1 minus c. So the logarithm of 1 over 1 minus c, which is logarithm of z prime, by this. Okay. And we don't need to write down the third logarithm because the fact that we've made the angles now add up to zero means the product of z, z prime, and z double prime is now one. The sum of the three logarithms, the adjusted logarithm we get here, is um, the sum of the three logarithms is um, zero. So anyway, I just need to write down two because the third is then described. And I'll call these W0 and W1. 
So another way of describing the flattening is to simply describe branches of the logarithm of z of the logarithm of 1 minus z. They're not exactly branches because we're possibly adding odd multiples of pi rather than even multiples of pi, but very close to being branches of these two logarithms. So you can think of w0 and w1 together. So give a point in the universal abelian cover of C minus 0, 1. Okay? Changing the branch of log z is basically taking cover over 0, taking the z cover over 0, while changing the branch of log of 1 over 1 minus c, which is minus log 1 minus c, is changing the branch over 1. Okay? This isn't quite true, again, because p and q may be odd. So if p and q are allowed to be odd, then we're actually getting four copies of this universal abelian cover. We have four copies of... Let me give this a name. The universal abelian cover I'll call simply c hat for the moment, okay, of c hat. 